welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm Chris Collins. Today we're going to talk to a man who, well, I would say is probably the dean of the Western Mass Delegation. It's the first time in 50 years that we actually have a member of the Franklin County Delegation in a position of leadership in one of the chambers of the legislature. He's a guy you know and love, State Senator Stan Rosenberg, Senate President Stan Rosenberg. Welcome to Thank FCAP. you. Thank you. Your first, uh, first foray in here, and we have a lot to talk about, and I appreciate you making the time. I know you're very busy. Happy to do it. I want to start off with something that's actually pretty new. Only, the story broke, I think, in the last couple of days. This millennial initiative that you've, you've launched, Eric Lesser, who's a new, a new senator from yep. Western Mass, mm -hmm. you put him in charge of an effort to connect more with younger voters, and I'm wondering why you think that this is important. Well, um, the uh, largest number of people in society now are uh, people under 30 years of age. And so we're used to thinking about the baby boomer generation being the dominant generation. Well, there are now more millennials than baby boomers. And if you put the millennials together with the Gen Xers, you have the overwhelming majority of the population. And uh, th uh, that said, millennials are, although very civic minded, really care about their communities and really engage with their communities, they're very cynical about government, and they just, they don't want to vote, they don't want to participate, they think government can't get anything done. So we want to hear from them what their concerns are. We want to engage them in helping to develop legislation and policy to address those concerns. And uh, in the process, we'll end up with better results, and we will also hopefully uh, turn some of them from uh, cynics into supporters and, and uh, folks who want to stay engaged with government. Now, in terms of engagement, how do you do that? I know you had a round table in Springfield recently, but do you have cocktail parties? How does it work? So this is a brand new initiative. And the first event, as you said, was just uh, about 10 days ago in Springfield. And we're going to have seven or eight or nine of them. They're not all going to be the same format. Uh, last one was a round table. I think the next one's going to be a round table. But we're leaving it to the local folks who are working on organizing to tell us what they would like to do in their area. So again, it's part of engaging them on their terms rather than us sort of swooping into town. You may remember the Commonwealth Conversations we did yes. in uh, February and March of the first year of my presidency and uh, was wildly successful and it was a formula. Every place we did roughly the same thing from about 7.30 to about six, we ended up in uh, meetings and sessions and briefings and visiting colleges and schools, et cetera. Uh, it, it was unique to each area, but it was the same formula. And then in the evening, we had a forum. We don't want to do the same thing with the millennials. We want them to tell us, how do we connect with the people in your neighborhood? Now, you've done these kinds of things before. You have a Citizens Legislative Academy that you guys do. Yep. You also come out here every year and do a, a conference this year. You're going to be a GCC. Yep. That's always good. So it's, it's always good to, to sort of get in the heads of constituents. You talk about millennials, though. I mean, I, I agree. I think there is a, a good degree of cynicism. But then you see what's happening with Bernie Sanders and the number of young voters and young people who are coming out. I mean, record numbers turned out yeah. in New Hampshire for that primary. And I know you're not, you're not going to pick a, a, a candidate. You'll go with the, whoever the nominee is. But what do you make of that and that phenomenon? These people seem to be really in love with this. Young guy. people love to get involved in presidential politics. I've seen that every four years. And and uh, you know Barack Obama did had the same effect. I think this is a little bit bigger with Bernie uh, because of some of the things that he's talking about and the way in which he's talking. He is so genuine. Uh, you know Barack Obama is a great speaker and can't take anything away from him. And he had good messages too. But this guy is so unique in how he how he presents himself. And I think it's just really touching a nerve with the public, including uh, young people. Uh, and so yes. Uh, a lot of uh, young people will come into contact with the system, and let's hope they stay engaged. Uh, but for us, it's also important uh, that we hear from them about the problems and issues that they're facing here in Massachusetts so that we can have responsive policy and legislation. In that first event, what were some of the things they were most concerned about? Uh, student debt. That's a big one. A uh, very, very big one. Um, uh, uh, encouraging what they call disruptive technology. So don't quash things like Uber and Lyft, which is not big around our parts, but very big in, uh, in urban settings. Uh, and also recognizing that you know, students uh, of young people are shopping online. Uh, students are doing uh, 
um, a substantial portion of their communications, uh, interaction with the media, uh, reading newspapers online instead of uh, buying a newspaper and things of that nature. So they want us to understand the huge role the technology plays in their lives and to encourage and not discourage by policy things that will make life convenient for them in the way that they're uh, used to receiving information and, and interacting with the world. What about energy? Because lately you and the Senate and the House have been at loggerheads a bit on net metering and the increasing, you have to increase the amount of solar uh, energy in Massachusetts. Were the younger people concerned about that? Because that's really the wave of the future. They didn't, uh, they didn't point to that specifically, but uh, things around energy and what's happening in the economy did come up. You know, affordable housing, the cost of energy, the uh, quality and, uh, and availability of health care, uh, the fact that they're buying insurance now for the first time, many of them, uh, health insurance that is, so the costs associated with that. So yeah, those things did come up. What about global warming and, and environmental issues? Seems like uh, a lot of young kids are concerned about Climate change was yeah. definitely something that was mentioned <clears throat> and, and they think about that a lot. Shifting gears, another thing that came up this week, and I don't want to make a big deal about this, but Senator Brian Joyce uh, was, investi or was being investigated by the FBI, and you kind of got sandbagged by the Mass Fiscal Alliance the other day in the hallway. I saw it on YouTube where uh, these guys came out and basically demanded that you expel him. And your response was what? Uh, due process. Americans are entitled to due process. When someone makes uh, charges that you did something wrong, uh, you deserve the opportunity for an investigation to play itself out. And if uh, there were to be some uh, charges that were sustained in the long run, then the legislature would have to take action. But at this point, uh, <coughs> we're not going to hang somebody based on the perception that is created through uh, media coverage. And in this case, it's even more pronounced because there were previous uh, claims made uh, one with the Office of Campaign and Political Finance and one with the State Ethics Commission, both of which he got cleared. So had we acted precipitously and prematurely and dispelled and dispelled, expelled him at that time, we would have been in egregious error because he was found guilty of nothing except for bad paperwork in one yeah. case and then nothing at all in the other case. And so, no, we are due, due process in this country and uh, the, the Constitution uh, for me is is extremely important that we uphold the values that are inherent in the Constitution. With technology, it's so easy to try people in the court of public opinion. And as a it. politician, you're almost guilty until proven innocent, right? Unfortunately, yes, <laughs> but I wouldn't limit it to just uh, uh, politicians because you can uh, go back and think about business leaders and labor leaders and um, others who in the community are accused of various things and uh, later are found to have uh, done nothing wrong. But by that point, how do you get your reputation and your name back, the, the impact on your family that, that occurred during that period? But look, if you're a public figure or if you're in, in a very high position in society, uh, that comes with the territory and you expect it, especially if you're a public, um, uh, a public official. But let me say, we, we have a very, very, very high ethical standard in the legislature and in the Senate, and we will adhere to that. So if uh, if this investigation uh, produces uh, evidence that there's something wrong, then the legislature, I'm sorry, I keep saying the legislature, in this case it's the Senate, will have to uh, review that and take appropriate uh, measures. In a situation like this, and I know that ethically you have to go through due process and, and if there is wrongdoing, you'll take action. But on a personal level, I mean, Brian Joyce is somebody who's been a, an ally of yours for yes, quite a while. Yes. I mean, when something like this happens and someone has FBI agents rifling through their law office and this guy's a friend of yours, you've worked with him, doesn't that have kind of a human impact on you? Absolutely. It, at first, it takes your breath away. You're just like stunned that somebody you're that close to and that you know that well uh, basically is in that situation. But when you see the pictures and you see FBI agents pull, uh, coming out of a building with boxes, it just, it really, it, it goes, it hits you in your core, in your gut. Um, but, you know, it's part of the process, and um, the, uh, the, this was a court sanction, so this is not a, uh, a willy-nilly uh, ad hoc uh, event. Um, uh, something was presented to the court, which uh, left the court believing that it was appropriate for uh, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney, whoever is involved, uh, to pursue the matter further, and so we will... We'll wait for the result of their work.
I'm wondering, you know, as a senator out here in rural Western Mass, you were relatively anonymous, not locally. I mean, the local media knew who you were, but on a statewide level, you were pretty much flying under the radar. And now, you know, Every you become day. Senate president <laughs> and you're thrust right into the limelight. And I, I know that there have been some, a lot of reporting about your personal life and other things. How, how does that change how you go about the job? I mean, you've never been afraid to, you never ducked a question with me. You've never been afraid to talk about the issues, but it would seem to me that you have to be a little more cautious, a little more guarded. So part one, uh, to show you how unknown I am when I was named <clears throat> chair of the Ways and Means Committee, the Boston Globe referred to me as the little known senator <laughs> from Western Massachusetts. So that just Does goes that to show you. mean you're little and known or just little known? <laughs> little yeah. unknown. Right. Uh, but in any event, no, it was little known. But, um, and that was 15 years ago. And here I am uh, 15 years later and I, w and, and I was back to being unknown because I hadn't been on Ways and Means for 15 years. But uh, so now you just know you live in a bubble. You're, you're under, um, under scrutiny constantly. Um, I have more contact with the press than I could ever have imagined. Fortunately, most of it is focused on issues and public policy matters, but then there are the situations like this, and as you referenced, my own uh, situation. And uh, I'll never forget, I, I went to see uh, the former Senate President Therese Murray uh, to tell her that um, I had uh, secured the votes, and that was 17 months before I actually uh, had the opportunity to be elected, but I had the votes. And she said, well, congratulations, but let me tell you from this day until the day you leave that office, even though you haven't even been elected to it yet, now that you know that you've got the votes and the public knows you got the votes, you will be under scrutiny and, uh, and some people would say you will have a target on your back. It comes with the territory. It seems like the Boston press likes to try and gin up some kind of a rivalry between you and Speaker DeLeo. That they, they love, that to, they love to play every, the Senate against the House. Always, and, and, always. And I'm not sure, I guess, how do you play that? I mean, how do you diffuse that? It's all about the drama, you know, and they're always, you know, like in elections, it's about horse racing, horse races when it's uh, coming to uh, looking how the legislative bodies are, are operating. It's the point person in both bodies, and they always try to make it appear like we're having conflict. So. If we, if, we were in, if we were unanimous, we would only need one legislative body. We have a House and a Senate. Every state other than Nebraska has a House and a Senate. And be, we both have similar jobs, but we're there with a different thing. We have much larger districts. They have much smaller, smaller districts. And in most states, senators have four-year terms and reps have two-year terms so that there is this longer-term vision, yeah. larger vision, and... and so, but this is forever that they, they portray this conflict. The speaker and I get along great. We have very good conversations. We don't agree on everything, but when we disagree, we're not disagreeable. But you couldn't tell that from the press coverage in the Boston media. You One think the, we were at each other's <laughs> throats exactly. every day. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> One of the other things that they like to do is they like to make a big deal about the fact that <clears throat> you have a Democratic legislature and a Republican governor, and, and yet, I think <clears throat> of all the Republican governors you've dealt with, Charlie Baker seems like the easiest probably guy to deal with, right? Absolutely. He, he, he's, he's more of a centrist. He recognizes the, the dynamic and that he's never going to be able to go hard right on anything. And yet your harshest criticism of the governor has come in this budget because yeah. his budget that he produced and released recently, not only did he not spend up to the amount he could spend up to in terms of the spending level, but he gave like 1.4% increase to UMass, and Chapter 7, the education funding, doesn't even cover negotiated contracts. And, and you were very vocal about that, much more so than you usually are. Talk about your reaction so to that. So what I was trying to communicate at that point, and, and I think I've started to get the point across, is that last year, the governor came in, he inherited a budget that was out of balance. The legislature and the governor worked to put it into balance. He started the budget process uh, for this upcoming year saying that we were going to have a structural deficit and he was not going to be able to fund everything at the level he wanted to fund it. And yet all of the discussion about the budget is framed as a spending problem. And so the point that I was trying to make was the governor promised on the campaign trail that he would give education the same percentage increase as the growth in state revenues. The number they agreed upon was 4.3%.
he was unable to even reach 2%. So the point that I was trying to make is, if this is a spending problem, and the governor has already level funded and cut many of the accounts, and still couldn't keep his top spending priority, which is K through 12 education, then is this really a spending problem? Yeah, well, I mean, and I think that, that that's what it comes down to. I mean, the, the age old argument is, are we spending too much or are we not spending enough? But when you don't even come up to the level, when you by almost 2%, yeah. it's hard to argue. I mean, it's, it's one thing to be fiscally austere, and I get that. And this is also a governor, by the way, who wants to lift the cap on charter schools, Correct. which is a, another big issue that you're dealing with. And how, yeah. how is that going to shake out, do you think? Well, it, there's a ballot question, and the ballot question says uh, up to 12 new charters a year under the cap. And underperforming school districts, there can also be charters that don't apply to the cap. So this would be a huge increase in the number of charters. And um, so it's a very controversial issue. Last term, the House voted to increase the cap, both the number of students and the number of charters that could be handed out. The Senate defeated it on a, with only nine votes in favor for the House version and 13 votes in favor for the Senate version. So the Senate was resolute 18 months ago now. No more charters. We have a cap that still has room for another 17 charters. The number of students, the cap on the number of students in many places has been reached. So there is a problem in some communities that want to have more charters. So this is going to be a, uh, a major debate in the legislature over the next two months because some people would like to get that question resolved in the legislature rather than the ballot. But it's going to be very hard to do that because, as I said, the Senate, as recently as roughly 18 months ago, voted n not to lift the cap, work within the additional 17 charters that you can have under the cap. Is there any way to lift the cap and hold harmless districts like Frontier, which could be devastated. I mean, rural regional school districts are already getting killed by choice and charter all over the place across the board. Is there any way to frame it so sure. small districts don't get hammered? Yes, um, you can because it's a law and it's, you know, it wouldn't violate the Constitution in any way as long as there's equal educational opportunity available. So yeah, we could carve out, you could use population, you could use performance measures, you could use a uh, percentage of students who are already in a charter or various, various ways of doing that. So the answer is yes. Uh, and that will be discussed. And that's one of the things that I'm putting as a rural legislator on the table, which is charter schools don't have the same impact financially or programmatically in every place. If there's differences between rural and suburban, and uh, urban communities. There's something like 38,000, I think, was the number of kids on a waiting list for charters? They've uh, revised it. It's 34, according 34, to the Department okay. of Education. Same difference. It's a very substantial number of children who are on the waiting list. Let me ask you a philosophical question about education. It, if charter schools are doing a better job educating kids, and that seems to be the argument in favor of lifting the cap, that they do a better job, is there nothing we can learn from how charter schools educate that we couldn't change on the state level in terms of K-12 to make those schools more like charter schools? A, that is part of the purpose of the charter school, authorizing charter schools was to have experimental opportunity and to take the knowledge that is generated by that and put it into the public schools. Some people would say some of that is going on. Some people would say, but not enough. And some people would say that there's just too much resistance and tension between the charters, public charters and traditional public schools to be able to make that work uh, well. So, so there, is, uh, uh, there is an intent from the very beginning that this kind of experimentation should uh, be reflected in traditional public schools over time as well, and some of it is occurring. And one of the things that charters don't have to deal with is things like special education. They can kind of even though they do, they draw lots, theoretically they can pick and choose which students they take. And so it's easy to skim the cream off the top and not have to worry about the other and stuff. And that's one of the things we're discussing on the Senate side. We're, we're trying to change the discussion from how many charter schools and how many children in charter schools to how, if you're going to have charter schools, how do you have the highest standards in all charter schools? And how do you ensure that we're working to try to protect traditional public schools so that we don't end up with holes in their budget and things like that? 
A lot of people in Eastern Mass do not understand what we're talking about here. You know, exactly. I know, right. the people who are listening understand what the impact of charters is in a rural district. And so we're trying to communicate that to people who don't have a clue what we're talking about. They have so many children in so many schools and so many classrooms, they can absorb the loss of children into charters with, with, and being able to adjust without devastating schools. But when you have declining enrollment in rural population areas and you start moving children from a good school to another good school, you start to drop the quality of the good, first good school because there aren't enough dollars left. Exactly, and, and the fixed costs like regional school transportation don't right. go away. No, none right. of those fixed costs go down. Yep. I want to go back to UMass because we kind of glossed over that. The governor wants to give 1.4% increase to UMass. It's actually 1%. They've recalculated, oh, they've recalculated and they agreed that it was 1%, not 1.4%. 1%. The rate of, of growth in this state is supposed to be 2.5% with Prop 2.5%. So I, how do you get away with that? And what is an, how much is enough, I guess, of an increase? Well, at minimum, we should be funding the collective bargaining agreements because if the administration agrees on collective bargaining agreements, you ought to at least pay those. You can't do that within the 1%. And it's not just UMass. That applies to GCC as oh, well, sure. which is right here in our backyard here. And I just met with Bob Pure, the president of GCC, yesterday. And uh, there is no way under the under the increase that the governor has provided that they could do the collective bargaining. I've never seen so, Bob Pure get mad, by the way, but I got to oh, I got to believe that he's mad about this. He's frustrated. I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to say mad. I would just say he's frustrated, but he's a very um, professional individual. Yes, he is. And totally respectful. So he expressed himself clearly, but um, but uh, without uh, excess emotion. And by the way, Baker's <laughs> numbers aren't the final word because you're going to have your own version, the House will have their Correct. own version, and somewhere in the middle. And this may be one of those times when it will, be, it will help to have a Democratic supermajority because if Baker vetoes, you can always override We him. did last year. Um, the Senate proposed a $24 million increase. The conference committee agreed to 18. The governor cut it down by 5.4, so he brought it down to about uh, 12 point something. And both the House and the Senate overrode, and so the UMass system got the 18. We only have a couple of minutes left in this first segment, but I want to talk about opioid funding yes. and drugs. I mean, drugs are tearing apart, especially these rural communities, uh, and it seems like it's getting worse, not better. And even though we have a great task force in Franklin County and, and the North Quabbin region, it just seems like we're, it's, we're, it's, it's like pushing a rock up a hill. Uh, what is the legislature doing in terms of funding opioid treatment and how do you fund treatment rather than enforcement of uh, drug laws? So um, the, this is one of those great examples where the governor and the legislature are working very closely and very well together. We've done uh, policy changes and funding increases in three supplemental budgets and the main budget for FY16 to increase the number of beds for treatment, uh, keeping uh, creating situations where we're not putting people in prison. Instead, we're putting them into treatment which is a better use of the dollars. It's less expensive. You can treat more people with the same dollar, and it's a more humane situation. So we focused on treatment uh, for the last, uh, let's say, 14, 15 months. We've now shifted focus to prevention. And there's a piece of legislation that's being conferenced right now in the um, uh, conference committee between the House and the Senate. The governor put some good ideas on the table, the House and the Senate. And we now have to reconcile the differences. I hope there'll be a bill on the governor's desk in a matter of a few weeks focused on prevention, training, uh, trying to reduce the number of pills that are prescribed, the number of pills, therefore, that might find themselves in the hands of folks who uh, really ought not to be having them. It's such a tough issue because, and I talked to Ruth Poti about this, who's the medical yeah. advisor of the county task force, and she told me something that blew me away. She said that. that You'd be amazed at the number of kids that are coming in that she's seeing for whom heroin is their first drug of choice, the first drug they've ever tried. Yep. It used to be that it started with booze and then usually went to pot and then usually went to other things. It's cheap and available. It is. And a lot of these kids have gotten their first high off of prescription painkillers from their parents' medicine cabinet. Right. And that's where it starts. I, I mean, it seems like we're trying to use a, a, a 1970s approach to a really a 2016 problem. According to some data, the governor is very good in the data, but I'm, I'm guessing 
but I'm pretty sure that I'm close. He says 80% of all of the pills, painkiller pills are, that are prescribed in the world are prescribed in the United States. It's amazing. And we don't have 80% of the world's population. No. So it is, it's an epidemic of, of controlling pain through chemistry. That chemistry can addict the taker, the user of it, and as you point out, the kid goes to the medicine cabinet, sees this bottle of pills, it's Oxy, it's Percocet, whatever, recognizes the name, pops a few pills, and they, they start getting hooked. And then when they run out of the pills, heroin gives you a, a bigger high, five bucks a hit. What I think is encouraging is that the governor recognizes this as a medical problem and not a, a law enforcement problem. And that's so interesting because for probably 30, 40 years in this country, it was approached exclusively as a criminal problem. That is, you're breaking the law, and now it's recognized uh, across the country that it's really a medical problem. It's a disease, and once you get, once you get this, you can't get rid of it. Exactly. It's a chronic condition for the rest of your life. Well, it alters your brain chemistry. Yeah, yeah. It alters your brain. And, and, and by the way, I think a piece of this, unfortunately, is looking, looking at the shift in who started to use it. And once it uh, went out of the, you know, the inner cities and started going into the suburbs and into rural communities, the demographics changed and people started to see it everywhere. And now it was a different story. And then we have tons of people that are in prison right now because of drugs. And, and I'm not saying you can't let all those people out. But I think with Chris Donlan's on, on the right track at the Franklin County House of Corrections, right. he has an actual, an actual therapy program built in to right. for people who are incarcerated for drugs. And up until this new set of beds that's opening in Greenfield, the only place you could go for an overnight is, is the jail. jail. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's crazy to me. Hey, this county and the sheriff, there's no place better in the Commonwealth in terms of how folks are dealing with this. That task force that you mentioned earlier, the work the sheriff's doing, the triage, the collection of organizations in town, in the county, I mean, and, and in the North Quabbin area that are working together. No place in the Commonwealth is this being dealt with better, and people are looking to this area to see the things that are succeeding. I think that's, that's one of the great success stories in recent memory in Franklin It is, and it's unfortunate that we have to have that as a success story, but the fact is it's out there. Better we take the lead than sit around uh, well, woe is me, what do we do? And that'll be how we'll end part one of my two-part interview with Senate President Stan Rosenberg. When we come back in part two, we're going to talk about a number of issues, including the proposed natural gas pipeline, which has everybody, I think, especially in this area, talking. This is Beacon Hill Update. My guest has been Senate President Stan Rosenberg, part two upcoming. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.